shipwreck tale coming up very shortly. The story of the General Grant. Oh, what a miserable night. And then it got worse for the survivors on the island. We're still on Auckland Island and by no means run out of shipwrecks of Auckland Island. John McChrystal regales a tale of the General Grant this hour. And I should advise I am taking some leave. I haven't taken leave in ages because I love doing the show and I'd rather be here. But in my place next weekend, Paul Cassily. Despite his criminal past, he is a tremendous broadcaster. And it's business as usual. We'll take a break, don't go anywhere. Hope you're snug and warm. Listen to the tale of those who didn't have it that lucky. Nanny dead on day one, the tale of the General Grant. It's become legendary because people have thought it was full of gold and they keep going looking for it. People have died trying to look for it. John McChrystal, when we return. Radio Live. It's Graham Hill's Weekend Variety Wireless. The wind and the wild never tattled till sun and a wave broke over the river. And every man knew it as the captain did. It was the witch of November come stealing. Welcome to another shipwreck tale. And there are plenty from the Auckland Islands. We started off the series with the wreck of the Grafton, that miraculous, no fatality, self-rescue after 19 months in the Auckland Islands. Last week, a more miserable story, the wreck of the Invercold and many casualties, skeletons and graves remaining on the Auckland Islands. We are still on the Auckland Islands this week and perhaps because of legend uh, and ongoing interest, this is the most famous, the General Grant. Our shipwreck storyteller, John McChrystal. Yeah, she, she's sometimes described as the, the Mount Everest of Southern Hemisphere shipwrecks and that's mostly because she's got everything really. She's got a great story. She's one of the great mysteries of the sea. After all this time and many, many, many different expeditions expending a lot of effort, no one's ever quite managed to find out where she is. And of course, the reason everyone's been looking for her is she's got a good deal of gold aboard. So there's that tang of sunken treasure there too. There was about two and a half thousand ounces of gold on her manifest. It's pretty likely that that was aboard. Mm -hmm. There's been a persistent rumour that there was considerably more gold aboard because there's been so much difficulty uh, in actually locating that wreck. There's been various conspiracy theories down the years that perhaps this was a bit of an insurance job or perhaps there was no gold aboard her in the first place and it was necessary that the ship was made to disappear somewhere en route. Yeah, um, it is the human story that is of the greatest interest in all of these stories. Oh, by the way, listeners, we'll have some pictures up on our webpage too that relate to this shipwreck. Boy, you can read a lot of backstory into some of these pictures when after you've heard John McChrystal, you'll understand what exactly you're looking at. Okay. Let's go for the General Grant, the most famous of the shipwrecks, but the human story of the General Grant and, first of all, how she ended up a wreck on the Auckland Islands, another. She's um, the classic story, I guess, of how ships came to come to grief on that coast. Uh, she set sail from Melbourne on the 5th of May in 1866 with 56 passengers, 26 crew and her captain by the name of William Herbie Laughlin. She'd been sailing before a pretty good breeze until the weather closed in two or three days before she got into trouble. Her last observation was at 0800 hours on the 11th of May. The captain knew he was in the vicinity of the Aucklands and so he ordered a watch for land to be kept on the 12th. Still no sight of the sun and still no sign of land. He doubled that watch on the 13th and late that night, 10.30 at night in fact, uh, the dread call went up, land on our port bow. Mm. Okay, describe the General Grant. What sort of affair are we talking about? What sort of a floating concern is it? A lot of people. 
Yes, she, she's a big, handsome ship, actually. No photos of her survive, but I've seen photos of her sister ship. She's 180-odd feet long, big, solid vessel, high bows and very tall masts. She's a pretty imposing-looking vessel, and that needs to be borne in mind when you start looking at the pictures that have been made from survivors' accounts of what it looked like when she was wrecked, mm. because the Auckland Islands make this enormous vessel, this enormous sailing vessel, look like a toy. There were 83 souls, including the captain aboard, so yeah, that's a that's a fair few people. Most of them were gold miners. They were taking their passage from Melbourne back to England, presumably because they'd made their fortune. Uh, another reason why it's speculated there was more gold aboard than was officially listed. Pretty much all of these people, you imagine, crowded the docks to go up the gangplank, and they were they were really looking forward to the rest of their lives back in England, where maybe they'd left in reduced circumstances, and here they were coming back with a pile of gold in their pockets ready to, to sort of cut a dash amongst the society where they'd struggled previously. That's the kind of dream that comes badly unstuck so often for us, doesn't it? The wrecking of the General Grant uh, is an extraordinary affair, as far as I've heard it described by survivors, and people have tried to depict it. Take us through how it was wrecked. As we've noted, she's, she sighted land on her port bow. She was sailing before a nor'west wind at that stage. The captain seems to have supposed that what he was looking at is the bottom southwest corner of Auckland Island. His immediate evasive action was to turn south and to run before the wind to try to clear the, the land for the south. They ran that way for about half an hour and then, because they hadn't seen anything further, they decided they were safe and he ordered her to stand back on her course for Cape Horn, so sailing pretty much due east. They did that for 20-odd minutes, and then the horror, the even more horrible cry of land on our starboard bow came up, and then straight away land, land dead ahead. Uh, within a couple of minutes, it became all too plain that this was the rest of Auckland Island right in front of them. So their initial sighting had been of Disappointment Island, which lies pretty much due west of the middle of Auckland Island. Where they were now was somewhere to the southeast of Disappointment Island and right on top of Auckland Island. Oh dear. As described last week, sheer cliffs coming straight out of the ocean. Th then you add the 60 foot high pounding waves and bad weather. Yeah, that's what you're facing. So th that's where the General Grant found herself, and as we have noted with the other vessels we've discussed, no reverse gear in these things, and just no way of turning around and sailing back the way you came. Didn't help the General Grant that she lost the wind immediately, that she found herself in this perilous position. So being at the mercy of the currents, there was nothing she could do to prevent her total destruction, really. It wasn't just coming up against the rocks and cliffs of the Auckland Island. It was a cave, uh, and it's, it seems kind of spooky. Does it what? <laughs> yeah, it's um, probably the thing that captured the imagination of people most in the day was the fact that after she'd been washed around a little bit by the, the currents and the waves, she sort of struck one of the projecting points of Auckland Island, first by the bow, then she struck another by the stern, and then after that she was driven by the waves into what's described as an enormous cave, the first uh, people aboard knew about any of this, of course, was when bits of the mast and bits of rock started raining down on top of them. They had to order all hands to, to the aft of the vessel while the foremast got wrecked. On the ceiling uh, of the cave? On the ceiling of the cave, it seems. Short time later, the main mast struck it as well. So there she was. She was wedged in a cave. And, and everyone was huddled, huddled on the stern, middle of the night. And the mast was forced down through the keel, I understand. It's like the ship was wedged in there. That's right. She was just absolutely jammed in there. They spent the night like that. The, the weather had moderated, the wind had dropped, the sea had dropped away a fair bit. Because there was no immediate danger, the captain ordered that everyone should just stand fast and wait until the morning before they attempted to launch the boats. They carried lanterns up the rigging and hung them over the side just to learn a little bit more about where they were. Memorably, it's been described as just a, a, sheer, a cave with sheer rock walls on either side on which not a bird might find a rest and no one could could hope to climb them mm. so they knew the situation of the ship was hopeless and it was just a matter then of waiting for enough light to try to get the boats off they began the abandoned ship operation about seven o'clock in the morning all the while the weather was getting worse the ship was rising and falling in her wedged in position 
the stub of the mainmast was engaging the roof of the cave and putting enormous strain on the keel of the vessel. Was there any thought that I oh, will stay on the ship? It hadn't sunk. No, she hadn't sunk, uh, but she was clearly going to. Okay. Uh, it, it, they were brutally exposed to the weather there, and it was plain that they'd had good luck to have lasted that long, but with a strengthening breeze, yeah, they knew their goose was cooked. So, so it, was life raft, it was life rafts after that? That's right. They had three boats aboard. They had a long boat, which is a relatively substantial boat, yeah, over 20 feet long, and then they had the usual gig and pinnace, which are both smaller vessels. They launched one boat, first of all, with a few sailors aboard who had some great big lumps of iron and a line, and the idea was that they would row this out and dump it over as an anchor, just so that the other boats could then use that line to pull themselves out and not have to worry about rowing. Ah. There was a bit of miscommunication, it seems, because while the line was rowed out, that boat was meant to return, but they stayed outside the cave and sort of watched from a distance. It's quite likely, I think, that those guys just decided that, yeah, they'd got out alive, they were going to stay out there, because to return was just to put themselves in more danger. Ooh. And this is where we begin to see the typical shipwreck thing happening, where human nature gets divided into the really good and the really not so good. Right. They get another boat in the water, and the idea is to start evacuating the women and the children on it, because, of course, there are both women and children aboard this boat. The first woman to volunteer to go was Mary Ann Jewell, who was nominally a member of the crew, but in fact was just the wife of one of the crew. The plan was to sort of crane her into the boat using a, one of the yards of the vessel, and she was sort of swung out, but seems to have fallen into the water. Her husband leapt over and managed to assist her into the boat. But seeing that sort of all turn pear-shaped appears to have discouraged anyone else from giving it a go. So everyone was basically resigned to staying with the ship until she sank sufficiently for the longboat to get off. We should remind people, if needs be, this is the sub-Antarctic. You fall in the water. If you stay in there for a few minutes, you're probably well worse for wear, if not dead. Yeah, that's right. Your, your survival time would be in the minutes, uh, just through sheer low temperature. Yeah. Needless to say, this is a pretty turbulent bit of water as well. Yeah. So, yeah, you're being knocked around in street clothes in extremely cold water. Well, this, as you say, this is the time when we first see heroism alongside appalling behaviour. Absolutely right. Everyone who survived the shipwreck remarks on the calmness and the orderliness of the evacuation operation arranged by the captain and executed by the crew, but it began to fray at the edges as, as the end came. They now had two boats in the water, both with a bit of capacity, but it seemed no way of getting anyone aboard them. They appear next to have just attempted to load the longboat where she was sitting on the after deck of the, of the ship and just to wait for the ship to go down. And in fact, that's what next happened. The vessel suddenly began to go, presumably as the mainmast punched a hole through the bottom of the ship, and yeah, she filled up and sank very quickly. The longboat washed off. There were around 40 men, women and children aboard that, and she got about 50 metres clear of the boat and then was capsized. So that was most of those who had got off the ship and uh, stood any chance of survival. Everyone who was left aboard the boat really had no chance whatsoever. Oh, a heartbreaking situations of people leaving their children. There were some appalling situations. There was one woman aboard, she was a cabin passenger, so presumably fairly well to do, but she had five children. Who knows what decisions she had to try to make in that situation, looking after her five children as the ship went down. There was a fellow by the name of Nicky Allen who had his wife and three daughters there. Apparently Rose Allen was um, standing with her three daughters on the deck yelling out to him to save them. He responded by climbing into the longboat and not even looking back as they rowed off. By contrast, another man stood there and tried to persuade Rose Allen to abandon her children and save herself. She refused and he dived over at the last moment and uh, made the longboat, so he nearly lost his own life. In fact, he did when the, the longboat capsized a short time later. Laughlin seems to have decided to stay with his ship. The last that anyone saw of him, he was up in the, the mizzen cross trees. So that's the back mast on the boat and right up high. So he climbed up there and seems to have made a gesture to the boats just to get clear of the ship and save themselves. And down he went. They couldn't find land and come back and get these poor people? 
No, that once they got clear of the cave, they it's been said by several of the survivors and by others who went back and visited for 20 miles in either direction, there was just absolutely nowhere you could pull up a boat. Oh. Uh, once again, these are perpendicular cliffs, and we're, by now we've got a large swell smashing against it, so not a chance. What an amount of heartbreak and loss of life in this one spot. Yeah. All and, at and, once. That's right, and it's described that a terrible cry went up, a terrible shriek went up, and then all was still. And another survivor said all was over with the rest fairly quickly. The only sort of consolation about the story is that it was mercifully quick. Shipwreck Tales with John McChrystal today. The most famous, or the most well-known of the names, anyway, of the ships shipwrecked in the Auckland Islands, the General Grant when we return, we'll find out how these miserable survivors get on and how the story got to be told when we return. Look at Go live. It's Graham Hill's Weekend Variety Wireless. Shipwreck Tales with John McChrystal. The General Grant smashed up in a cave in heaving waters in the Auckland Islands. Massive loss of life, men, women and many children. And a few managed to get on a couple of miserable boats and get clear of the wreck. So, John, take us from there. What happens next? Yeah, well, what you've got now, I suppose, is two small boats. Bear in mind, these are just dinghies, really. There's no shelter, comfort, or anything in them. There are 15 survivors out of the 83 aboard these boats, and once they're outside the cave, they're, they're sitting there and they're trying to work out what to do. The ranking officer is Bartholomew Brown, the first mate, but he's no use to anyone because he was commanding one of these boats, but he had to watch his, his wife standing on the after deck, pleading with him to come back. He tried to get his boat to return, but he was overruled by the others in it, as it was foolhardy. So he's just lost his wife, and apparently he was inconsolable and uh, no use in the decision-making process. As always happens with these shipwreck things, one person seems to come to the fore, and in this case it's a man by the name of James Tear. He's an Irishman, hard as nails. He was raised in a fishing village back in Ireland, came out, as many did, to Melbourne to try to make his fortune on the gold fields, and in fact seems to have done so because he was mourning the loss of quite a substantial number of gold sovereigns. He didn't do what a number of his sort of fellow miners aboard the General Grant did as she began to go down and sort of pile all, the, all their personal gold into their pockets and strap it on their persons and then jump in the water. He didn't think that was a very good idea, and so it proved. And, and some um, people did that. Yes, this yes. gold madness, isn't that's it? That's exactly right, and that's how Tia described them. He said lunatics and their gold. Ah, <laughs> wow. Just unbelievable. Yeah. In any case, Tia's the man sitting in the boat who takes command in the end. They sort of swap personnel amongst the boats until they've got enough fit people to row each boat and roughly even number of bodies aboard. And then they set off for Disappointment Island, which is well to the northwest of them. They had a hard row all day to try to make Disappointment Island, and they didn't quite do it. That's miles uh, away. Why didn't they just try away. try to find a, a little beachy bit where they were? Well, there, there just are no beachy bits okay. to be had, really. Yeah, but the decision was made, Disappointment Island it was. Well, that, that's not exactly uh, an easy place to land on either, but, uh, okay, they get there, what happens? It's not called Disappointment Island for nothing. Uh, <laughs> it's not Club Med. It's a scaled down version of Auckland Island itself. It's just sheer and very little vegetation that's of any use to anyone on top of it. Just a couple of little tiny stony beaches. In attempting to land on one of the aforementioned stony beaches, one of the boats capsized and most of their provisions are at this point lost overboard. They had 50 pounds of salt meat and 50 odd tins of soup aboard that boat, but then after they'd managed to get the boat back and sort of scoop what they could out of the water. They only had three pounds of pork and nine tins of soup. Oh dear. Yep. And meanwhile, of course, everyone in both parties, in both boats, were underdressed. Most of them were barefoot. They hadn't expected to be wrecked and such clothing as they put on, anything bulky they would have got off as quickly as possible when they were in the water. Most of what they wore was just no match for those conditions anyway, really. Cold, shocked, in some cases just 
in abject mourning for loved ones they've left behind, in at least one case tortured, one hopes, by a, by a very guilty conscience. It's hard to imagine human beings more up against it than these guys were at this point. And it happens so many times. Somebody goes, oh, hang on, I've got some matches. Yeah. When the weather moderated adequately, they went from Disappointment Island and rode around the top of Auckland Island into Port Ross, which is comparatively hospitable, and huddled on the stony beach there, three days, three nights without food, they decided that it was time they looked at cooking themselves a meal. So yeah, they do the Australian haka looking for matches. They come up with Bartholomew Brown, the first mate, managed to find a box of matches, struck one, and it lit to everyone's joy. But of course they had nothing gathered with which to set this match. That match burned down uselessly. Apparently he just went into a bit of a panic and just started lighting them one after the other. Oh no! In an attempt to light stuff around himself. Had to be wrestled to the ground and the last match taken off him. James Tear seems to have taken charge of this match and tucked it into his hair to keep it dry and ordered everyone to just wait until it was dry enough to make a decent job of it. And in the meantime, to collect everything dry and burnable they could find. When the moment was right, apparently they all huddled around and said a short prayer. Tia took out the match and struck it. Billy Sanguilly, who was one of the youngest people in that party, he's a lad of only 19 or so, he couldn't bear to watch and he snuck off into the shrubs because, first of all, he realised that if that match didn't light, they were probably all going to die. And if that didn't light and they couldn't cook themselves a decent meal, then he was most likely, as the youngest and smallest, to be the one selected to be dinner in subsequent days. They got their fire lit, the match lit, the tinder caught, and the fire was lit. Okay. And they didn't let that fire go out for the next 18 months. They opened one of their precious tins of soup, and they'd collected two albatross from Disappointment Island, so that was their first, first meal. Uh, <laughs> And that set the tone, really. From then on, pretty much their sole focus was gathering enough food to keep themselves alive until rescue came. How long are they there before people start thinking about cannibalism or, or worry about it? Well, this is hard to know. Um, again, these castaway stories, are, they, they just can't be treated as 100% reliable because the survivors are the ones who... Yep. have made hard decisions and maybe they've done stuff that they just don't want people in the wider world to know about. And probably have. And probably have, I think. There is a story that's been passed down amongst the family of one of the survivors that a life was actually lost when cannibalism was being discussed and they'd decided, in fact, on the, the fellow they were going to eat. They were chasing him through the scrub and in doing so, they saw a couple of pigs and they thought, woohoo, there are pigs. We don't have to eat each other after all. Right. So then they began chasing the poor fellow to let him know that, <laughs> let him know the good news. Uh, but he, of course, just knew that there were people blundering after him who last he heard meant to eat him. Uh, so he kept running away. And according to the story, he fell into a river and was swept out to sea. The flaw in that story is that there are no rivers on Auckland Island. There are plenty of ways you could fall into a water course and be swept out to sea, but not in a river. So that story, yeah, might just be a tall tale. You hope so, because Ever otherwise cover. there's an awful truth there. Yeah. Yeah. The group split up. Yeah, and this is another interesting thing as well. Again, the story is told by the survivors, and most of those who were involved in this breakaway group who went and based themselves at Carnley Harbour didn't survive in the end. Tia's group, who remained based at Port Ross, seemed to have been the, the more effectively functioning group in many ways, and it's pretty hard not to speculate on what it might have been that split them up. Tia had taken charge, but there was a ranking officer in their midst, and Bart Brown was one of those who disappeared off down to, to Carnley Harbour. The official reason that Tia gave when he was telling his story afterwards is that this group were looking for Musgrave's hut from the Grafton mm -hmm. because they'd read reports Melbourne was absolutely gripped by the story only two years before or a year before in fact when the survivors uh, showed up to tell their tale so they knew that there was a substantial hut and maybe some items of, of interest down there and Bart Brown is supposed to have led a group down there to find what they could find but yeah you do wonder there was one woman amongst these these rugged sailor types and 
there were two le two leaders, one official leader and one the unofficial leader. It's not hard to find ways in which that group might have fractured. A ship is sighted. Yeah, now this is just the ultimate heartbreak, really. How long have they been there now, when they see this ship? Well, it's October, so they were wrecked in May, so they've been there around six months. Uh, yeah, on October the 6th, they saw a ship, and it was a big ship, and it looked like it was heading for England, and just sailed past and carried on her merry way. I guess she has to go down as another near miss for the Auckland Islands. <laughs> a few hundred metres either direction, and she could have joined them in a Grafton Invercald style double act on, on Auckland Island. Oh, yeah. But how heartbreaking must it be? You're, you're reaching the end of a very, very hard winter, and what looks to have been your only opportunity for rescue has gone. Shortly after that, that seems to have galvanised them, at least, into thinking if if we can't rely on rescue, and that might have been our last chance, then we've got to rescue ourselves. What condition are they in at this moment? Because this is a long time for the uh, six, nine tins of soup that they had. Yeah, they've been surviving on seal meat and on the usual Macquarie Island cabbage, the still the carper. Uh, not everyone took to that particular diet that well. So they've been surviving, but they haven't exactly been thriving. So yeah, they're all pretty emaciated and weak. It sounds like most of them are suffering from some form of dropsy, although it's hard to know, just reading the survivors' reports, what that actual malady was. Oh, you could take but, your pick from quite a few in that condition, <laughs> yes, I would say. Oh. But it was likely not scurvy, but mm. it may have been some reaction to the vitamin A and the, the livers of the seals they ah, were eating. Yes. Uh, but either way, yeah, they're not the picture of health at this point. So they consider self-rescue as well after seeing the ship go off into the distance with that feeling of heartbreak. That's right. Uh, according to James Tear, it was agreed between himself and Bart Brown that if rescue hadn't arrived by sort of the middle of summer, they were going to have to do something about it themselves. And so Brown returned with his group from Carnley Harbour and they began fitting out one of the boats to send her north to, to New Zealand. So on the 22nd of January, Brown and three of the other sailors took one of the ship's boats with a bunch of provisions, pretty pretty heartbreaking selection of provisions really. They had seven tins of soup, which was all they had left. They had some seal flesh, they had some goat meat, and they had some boiled gull's eggs. They took fresh water and dried seal gullets. They didn't have a chart and they didn't have a compass, and as it turned out, they were tragically misinformed about where exactly New Zealand was in relation to the Auckland Islands. They believed it was somewhere east-northeast, and that was the direction they took. In fact, New Zealand is a little due west of, uh, is a little west of due north. And east-northeast is one hell of a lot of nothing. That's right. It's going to shoot the gap nicely between the Chatham Islands and New Zealand, and you'll just sail parallel to the, the coast of mainland New Zealand without ever sighting it. That might be what happened, but yeah, you sort of hope that the gale that sprang up a day after they left did for them and they didn't suffer a, a, a horrible death by starvation or, or death through thirst somewhere out on the high seas. It will never be known though. It'll never be known. They were no. never seen again. Exactly. Oh. Yeah, so again, it's a little like the situation that the two who were left on Auckland Island when the Grafton's master and the other two crew members sailed off to try to rescue them. Those left behind must have just had an awful wait, wondering what had become of the people they'd wave goodbye to. Became clear as summer turned to autumn and then autumn turned to winter that uh, they weren't going to be rescued by that means either. And so they began preparing themselves for yet another awful winter on Auckland Island. The only thing that went right for them in this period is they discovered how to catch pigs. James Tear, who had managed to sort of cobble together seal, sealskin clothing and a few other bits and pieces for them, figured out a way of bending a bolt, uh, a steel bolt which they'd found into a hook and fastening a, a rope that they made out of flax to it. What he'd do is he'd take this like a gaff and sort of lay in wait for the pigs and then hook the hook into a pig and then drop the pole, grab the, grab the line, and hang on for grim death. Um, they not only killed a few pigs this way, but they also captured a few and put them in a pen. And by the time they were rescued, in fact, they had quite a thriving community of Auckland Island pigs there. Nonetheless, the, um, 
uh, plenty of hardship, of course. Uh, were people dying because of exposure, weakness, starvation? Yeah. Um, around September, uh, so at the end of their second winter, one of the older member, well, the oldest member of their party, one of the seamen by the name of David McClelland, died at the age of 62. It seems as though he cut his finger, which seems pretty innocuous, but in a weakened, immune-compromised state, mm. uh, you're probably at the pr at, at the mercy of infection, and he seems to have died of septicemia. Yeah, which is, it just breaks your heart, really. You've survived all of that, and you've um, managed to assist in the effort of keeping everyone alive, and then you, you just conk out mm. when pretty much the end of the ordeal is, is nigh. There's very little remaining from the previous shipwrecks that we were talking about, but the Grafton's an exce exception, isn't it? There are some, they were quite industrious, they got to making seal skin clothing, and uh, the heartbreak of th those people going off, never to be seen again, uh, the, the people knew they're not going to, that those cats were dead because, yep. you know, nobody had come back for them. They made these little boats with messages on them, just kind of like a message in a bottle thing. Help us. Yeah. These have survived, or at least one of these little boats they made have survived. They, they carved wooden hulls, ballasted them with a bit of metal and gave them a tin sail and carved into them. General Grant wrecked, gave the dates, gave their location and added the poignant words want relief and set these sailing off into the, the the vastness of the southern ocean in the hope that someone would pick them up um, they also inflated seal bladders and attached some of the messages to those and sent them floating off so that yeah they were they were trying everything and uh, considerable in ingenuity where one of the one of these little boats saying help us it, it survived was it picked up at sea or was it just found in during construction no, that they'd built it, but they never got a chance to launch it because they were rescued before that they set it set it off. Good heavens! Yeah, what a memento from that yes. time. Yes, yes, I think that's in Southland Museum. That one, I can't remember whether that's Southland Museum or Canterbury, but either way, uh, you can see that yeah. Southland Museum has a fantastic display actually of General Grant uh, memorabilia and a, a decent mock up of bits and pieces of of their their shipboard life and their, their life as castaways. Tell us about this wheel, weird barrel stave with an inscription. Yeah, now one of the things that's haunted people down the years is that there was the possibility that while the Grafton and the Invercald were wrecked there and two lots of survivors were subsisting independently of one another, there may even have been a third on the island at the same time. A barrel stave was found by the General Grant people it seemed to have the name of a vessel, the Minerva, and it seems to have been the Minerva of Leith, and the words four officers, one man, uh, sorry, one, one officer, four men, and uh, a set of dates that actually correspond almost exactly with the Invercalds. There's been various different explanations for that b barrel stave. There was a whaler called the Minerva that operated in that area at roughly that time, so it may just be someone idly scrawling on a on a bit of wood while they were ashore and with no more significance than that. It may have been something to do with the Invercald, which has been suggested because the dates are, yeah, pretty closely coincident. Um, but the one officer and four men doesn't figure because there were in fact two officers and one man in the Invercald party. Mm. So yeah, you just can't help but wonder whether that had some significance, some awful significance. Uh, certainly the General Grant people thought it did. Okay, we have to take a break and we'll come back with the eventual rescue. It's not a spoiler because otherwise the story can't be told. How long have they been there before they, they rescued, before we take this break, John? 18 months. 18 months on Auckland Island. The rescue of the few survivors of the wreck of the General Grant when we return. Shipwreck Tales with John McChrystal. Radio Live. It's Graham Hill's Weekend Variety Wireless. The General Grant is our shipwreck story this week. John, how many survived and how were they rescued in the end after this 18 months on Auckland Island? As you recall, there were 15 got off the ship 
So out of 83, 15 had survived. Four had set sail uh, in their aborted or their ill-fated self-rescue mission. So that left 11. One of those left behind had died probably of septicemia, so that left 10. So there are nine men, one, one woman uh, still there. A month and a half after David McClellan died, uh, a sail was sighted and it disappeared east uh, into the mist. What a heartbreaking sight that must have been because that was the second time it had happened to them. But then two days after that, another ship was seen coming from the south and this time she appeared to be heading for Port Ross. Most of the group at this stage is on, in fact all of the group at this stage is on Enderby Island, which is a comparatively hospitable island just off the northeast coast of mm. the main island. And yeah, James Tier and a couple of the others jumped in the boat and set off rowing, I reckon, much as our rowing crews in recent Olympics covered themselves in glory, I reckon they would have struggled to match these guys, emaciated as they were, rowing after the ship as she headed towards Port Ross. They were rowing for their lives. They were rowing literally for their lives. Those left on Enderby Island were watching. They'd set fire to everything they could set fire to, as you would. They saw the boat taken aboard the vessel and the vessel went into Port Ross and anchored. So they knew at that point they were, they were on the point of being saved. This was the Amherst, who'd been out of Dunedin on a, on a sealing expedition. And yeah, she, she had headed first down towards Carnley Harbour and then on her way back, she'd decided to anchor at Port Ross. Captain Gilroy, to his amazement, saw these fellows struggling out of the bush and uh, pursuing them in their rowboat. Yeah, it was he who delivered them from this awful, awful ordeal. And they went from there, they went to Bluff, right? That's right. They were picked up from there. They seem to have allowed Amherst to spend six weeks or so uh, on a sealing expedition. This has happened in other shipwreck stories too, where the rescued allow the rescuers to go about their business so that they're not out of pocket, yep. which is <laughs> incredible. Well, they'd be nice. happy to have something to eat. Yeah, you would think so. Yeah, and carry on sealing. This is not bad. That's right. Compared to what we're used to, this isn't so bad. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, after the the holds are full of seal skins, off they go, and they sail back to Bluff, where everyone is just gobsmacked. Not only because their own story is so remarkable, but because it's following hard on the heels, of course, of the Grafton and the Invercald. And, yeah, these people stagger off the the Amherst dressed in the most outlandish sealskin clothing and there's a woman aboard which of course keeps the newspapers interested. So. And there are, there are photographs of this and we've got them up on our webpage, they're astounding aren't they? They are, they are. They're not bad clothes really. Yeah. They're, um, they're not fashion items but they're um, serviceable and I, yeah, I'm not sure that even given the amount of time these fellas had uh, sitting on the beach at Auckland Island I could stitch together anything like that. Yeah, yeah quite remarkable. Okay. Go to Weekend Variety Wireless uh, webpage. It's on radiolive.co.nz, Weekend Hosts, and you'll see the Weekend Variety Wireless. You can see those pictures and other pictures of artefacts from this uh, <clears throat> amazing story of the General Grant. Why it's so well known now, it's because people went back there time and time again to find this stupid gold. And I don't think anyone, is this true? No one really knows. They haven't found the cave where this ship is supposed to have been munched up like little matchsticks that can't be found. No, that's right. Um, yeah, when you visit Auckland Island, you get a sense of why that is. That whole coast is just riddled with caves. And yeah, not all of them are big enough to actually admit a ship the size of General Grant in the way that most people imagine she was admitted. But yeah, there are plenty of caves and plenty of indentations on in the coast there that are capable of swallow swallowing ships whole. And uh, yeah, that seems to have been what's happened to her. But the remarkable postscript to the General Grant survival story is that even after she'd sunk and even after the, the survivors had made it back to civilization, the General Grant kept taking a toll because as you say, people kept going back and looking for the stupid gold. Three of those who had survived, in fact, tempted fate and went back, which just seems incredible to me. James Tier was the first. He went back in 1868 and couldn't find the gold. David Ashworth went back in 1870. His luck ran out. He took a ship. He took a ship's boat around the west coast, and uh, while that ship lay at anchor at Port Ross and waited for them to come back with the gold, 
it became clear as time passed that, that that little boat was not coming back. So David Ashworth died on the west coast of the Auckland Islands after all. Oh. <laughs> yeah, which seemed a bit of a waste, really. Yeah. Nice. And then finally Cornelius Drew, who was another of the crew members, went back in 1876 and again couldn't find the gold. So, yeah, just a, it's a remarkable story. It's a remarkable, remarkable story. John McChrystal, thank you so much. The wreck of the General Grant, its location, still unknown today, could be under fallen rocks somewhere. <laughs> and so many people just go back there trying to find that silly goal. The human story is the biggest story, of course. And we thank you very much, John McChrystal, another Auckland Island ship. The legend lives on from the triple wall down of the big lake they call Good Sugar Lake. Superior, they say, never gives up every day.